Okay, so starting with the glorious name of Allah, the special merciful, the entirely merciful. He who has the power over all, all praise belongs to him, and he is the Lord of all worlds, the creator, the sustainer, the magnificent, and the greatest. We all are gathered here by his will, so it's an immense pleasure to start this session with the name of the greatest, the best of all, Allah Almighty. So for the recitation of the verses of Holy Quran, I would like to invite Anis Fadu. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله نيم Good evening everyone I am Irfan Asir from BSIR 2nd and I warmly welcome you all here on the behalf of Day Dreamers and tonight's session We'll continue the session with a short introduction of Day Dreamers, particularly for those who have just joined us today. Day Dreamers is a platform initiated by the group of students of International Relations at NAMAL with the main purpose to engage students in productive activities and polish their skills. The strategy followed by Day Dreamers includes OTD sessions and book review sessions that are held on the topics including contemporary issues, historical events, and other topics having some importance for CSS or PMS. In tonight's session, we have with us Dr. Abdurrahman Shah, who is the Assistant Professor at the Department of International Relations, National University of Modern Languages, Islamabad. He holds a PhD in, in International Relations from the School of International and Public Affairs, Jilin University, China, and an MPhil in International Relations from the School of Politics and International Relations, Kairiazam University, Islamabad. He has published articles in Asian Survey, Asia and Pacific Policy Studies, and Fletcher Security Review, among others. We all welcome you here, sir. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay. The, today's discussion is about CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, that is one of the six corridors of China's substantial project aimed to build world's largest and vibrant pathway of trade by investing huge amount of money. It was inaugurated in 2013, and initially it seemed to be the political and economic game changer in the Asian region, and it was a win-win situation to both proponents. Pakistan founded a window of opportunity and grabbed it as well through it. They can have their infrastructure and hydropower plants built in. And also China's economic and strategic goals can be best achieved by exploiting human, natural, and warm water resources of Pakistan and also by establishing alternative sea lane through West Asia. As Chinese banks finance these projects on subs subsidized interest, Pakistan's economic situation further aggregated aggravated by COVID-19 made it unable to pay its debt. So can Pakistan fall a victim of China's predatory debt policy or will it prove a lifeline straw for drowning economy of Pakistan? We'll have discussion on it with our guest, Dr. Abdurrahman. But before inviting him here, I would like to make a humble request from all of you to please make sure that your mics are turned off throughout the session and try not to disturb in between. If you have any questions, you can drop them into the chat box, and that will be answered at the end of the session. I'm highly hopeful of your cooperation. Looking forward to the great session of tonight. So now let's invite here Dr. Abdurrahman Shah. Thank you, Arfa, and thank you, Daydreamers, for inviting me uh, for this session. Um, first of all, this is quite encouraging to see you people uh, getting get together for this kind of productive session uh, that is very much helpful for students like you who are aiming for CSS and other competitive exams apart from that even academia so uh, this is quite a uh, helpful initiative on the part of daydreamers and I really appreciate that <clears throat> 
So today we are going to talk about CPAP, whether this is going to be a lifeline or a death threat um, in case of Pakistan. I will just start with the history of CPAP. What is CPAP? Um, how is it part of Belt and Road Initiative? And before uh, talking about Belt and Road Initiative, I will just briefly discuss the history of uh, Silk Road, which the Chinese government uh, is trying to emulate in the form of Belt and Road Initiative or One Belt, One Road Initiative. So um, and later on, I will discuss uh, the key projects in CPAC, how much the Chinese government has invested. Um, so, and uh, in the fourth part, I will discuss um, the issues that China is having in implementation of Belt and Road Initiative uh, in case of Pakistan. Finally, the main part that will be the discussion about the question whether this is going to be a death trap or it's going to be a lifeline for Pakistan that is becoming a much crucial question, um, especially since the American government under Donald Trump, they have decided to take on Belt and Road Initiative openly. And finally, I will um, wind up my entire discussion and arguments with a brief, um, uh, you know, comments. <clears throat> So before um, starting this entire debate about CPAC, as I said, what is uh, CPAC? And we all, all of us, we know that CPAC is part of Belt and Road Initiative, which was primarily called One Belt, One Road. Uh, in Chinese, it's called e Dai e Lo. Uh, later on, the Chinese government changed the terminology because the French government and American government, they became quite critical that why is Chinese government asserting that there is only one belt, there is only one road to the development of um, global society or world. So the Chinese government that become much more circumspect with this terminology and they decided to abandon the term one belt, one road uh, in English. But that is quite interesting because in Chinese, they still are using e dai e lo. And the... Uh, in English, they are using this alternative terminology, Belt and Road Initiative. So Belt and Road Initiative, that is a, a sort of an effort by the Chinese government to emulate the historical uh, Silk Road that was uh, spanning from China towards Europe, towards uh, Western Asia, towards um, Central Asia, these regions. So that is quite a romantic idea, China <clears throat> um, exporting silk, and other items, uh, including the cultural items towards the rest of the world. Um, even in uh, these Persian hi historians stop, like, you know, Hafiz, Saadi Shirazi, to some extent, uh, Maulana Rumi, they have also mentioned the Chinese uh, paintings, the Chinese silk in their poetry. So we have got a lot of evidence that the Chinese Silk Road in ancient times that was very popular, that was very global um, in its um, approach, in its scope. Silk Road that spanned from China and it was connecting the Chinese market to Western Asia, Central Asia, as I said, and especially Italy, that is part of the Southern Europe. And uh, this Silk Road that existed from 130 BC till mid 15th century, that is um, 1450s. So after 1450s, there is this gradual decline in Silk Road. So when we talk about the gradual decline of Silk Road, we talk about the land-based Silk Road, okay? And Silk Road by itself fundamentally that was land-based rather than maritime. Even if the Chinese government, they have been um, asserting time and again that there were two legs of Silk Road. Uh, the second one was maritime Silk Road, but we don't have um, enough or comparable existence or data about this maritime Silk Road if we compare it to this land-based Silk Road. So um, <clears throat> in brief, we can say that Silk Road that was basically land-based and Central Asian region that was one of the key regions connecting China to other markets in Western Asia and Europe. Apart from Central Asia, this, uh, South Asian countries, they were also very important, like Pakistan, like India. They were also important, for example, the Chinese monks they used to visit India 
for this cultural um, accumulation of knowledge in the form of Buddhism. So Pakistan and uh, India, they also have played major role in this Silk Road, in ancient Silk Road, apart from Afghanistan and Central Asia. Now, <clears throat> coming to Belt and Road Initiative, why the Chinese government decided to come up with the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, before starting this point, I will just briefly um, conclude that, you know, the 15th century, we saw this decline of, in 15th century, we saw this decline of, so the question arises as to, uh, you know, why this land-based Silk Road that saw decline in 15th century, in mid 15th century. Uh, the answer is that by mid 15th century, the world saw the decline of land based Silk Road because the maritime trade that was getting uh, popular, the European colonizers, the Portuguese, the Spanish. Um, uh, traders. The Belt and Road Initiative come into Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. In uh, 2013, the Chinese government under President Xi Jinping decides that China is going to launch um, an international development infrastructure development project that will be um, comprising two major components. The first one is uh, 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 land-based Silk Road, the second one is Maritime Silk Road. The first one was called 21st Century uh, uh, Silk Road. The second, was, the second one was called Maritime Silk Road. Okay, so uh, I'm just confusing these names, quite similar names. Um, it's quite ironic that, you know, the term road that was used for Maritime Silk Road and the belt, the term belt that was used for land-based Silk Road. Okay, now the Chinese government there focuses mostly on the maritime Silk Road because that is going to be much more important geoeconomically and geostrategically for their national interests. Now, the slogan of Chinese government about the Belt and Road Initiative or OBOR is that it's a win-win project and China after becoming, um, you know, advanced or after becoming prosperous domestically or internally is going to share its wealth, its riches in de its development project with the rest of the world, especially Asian countries, African countries, and parts of European countries, especially um, Eastern European countries. Now, this is um, a sort of a big question mark for the Americans and European uh, Union countries or American allies that whether this is really a Chinese project aimed to help these countries or China is seeking to expand its influence under the cover of Belt and Road or, uh, you know, this development project. So this is, you know, the question of competing narratives about the Belt and Road Initiative. If you read the Chinese literature, then they will be talking about all, uh, about Belt and Road Initiative, all the good things. But if you read American literature or American um, policy approach, uh, especially under Donald Trump administration, then you will find out that Belt and Road Initiative is nothing more than a death trap. It's nothing more than new imperialism. So what is there in Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, as I told you, it's uh, it has got two major components. One is land-based, the second is maritime-based. Uh, the land-based that is going to be focus, focused on energy projects that is going to be focused on infrastructure uh, development that is going to be focused on, uh, you know, internet technology development, these kind of, you know, development projects. The maritime seal code that is primarily going to be focused on development of ports and roads connecting those ports to industrial zones across the different countries in Asia, in Africa, especially Asia Pacific countries, okay, which the uh, Americans and its allies, they call Indo-Pacific rather than Asia Pacific, but the Chinese government, they are trying to um, <clears throat> call it Asia Pacific rather than Indo-Pacific. Now, uh, this project is multi-trillion project. For example, there are different estimates about 
the total investment portfolio to be made by the Chinese government under Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there are different estimates, but um, one of the most popular estimates um, uh, uh, counts these figures to be um, two to eight trillion dollar. Okay, now. <clears throat> The question arises whether the Chinese government can afford that much of investment, um, especially at the time when it's facing its own domestic problems. Now, uh, we can say that maybe the Chinese government, they will invest in billions, not necessarily in trillions, because on paper, when you plan something of such a massive level, such a global level, then it's not that easy as you plan it. So, so far, it seems the Chinese government, their investment that is running in billions rather than in trillions under the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, uh, coming to the point of CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, as Arfa mentioned, it is one of the six uh, economic corridors um, uh, of Belt and Road Initiative, but this is the most important of all the six corridors. Um, like you might know that it is uh, the only economic corridor that has been at the most advanced stages, that has been developed, that has been implemented to greater extent or to greatest extent. If you compare it to the other five um, economic corridors of Belt and Road Initiative. The second important thing about uh, CPAC is that there are only two countries in uh, <clears throat> this corridor. In the rest of five corridors, there are more than two countries. Now, that makes it rather easy for the Chinese government to, man to manage this project, to implement this project. And the third and final point, important feature of CPAC is that both the governments, China and Pakistan, they enjoy very good relations. Now, it gives China an edge, um, a lot of space in better implementation of Belt and Road Initiative. And China wants to show to the world by implementation of CPAC that our economic development model that can be emulated, that can be followed, that can be implemented by the rest of the world. It's not just about China. It's not about just, you know, few countries. But this project is a success story of the Chinese development model since, uh, you know, 1970s, late 1970s or um, early 1980s. Okay, because from 1980s onward, the Chinese economy that has grown massively to the extent that China, uh, you know, accumulated trillions of dollars of foreign exchange reserves. And because of those uh, extra foreign exchange reserves, about 3.5 to $4 trillion, the Chinese government under President Xi Jinping, they decided to go for that investment to rather than put those trillions of dollars idly in banks or in other uh, you know, accounts, increase the Chinese influence, increase the Chinese, uh, you know, economic model, increase the Chinese uh, access to global markets around the world. Okay. Now the question arises, why China wants to implement or why China wants to go for CPAC? Now, as I told you that Pakistan is the closest friend of China and Pakistan is also the neighboring country of China. Now, <clears throat> Pakistan has seen a lot of, uh, you know, domestic instability since this 9-11 war, um, war on terror. Um, likewise, at around the same time, the western part of China, Xinjiang, that also saw some major instability incidents, especially by late 2000s, 2008, 2009, and it was after that that the Chinese government, they also started thinking to invest a lot of money in neighborly countries so that the neighborly countries like Pakistan, they are also, you know, stable. And that if these neighborly countries, they will be stable, Chinese marginal, uh, uh, you know, provinces that lies on the margin of China, especially Xinjiang province, that will also be stable. So instability will not proliferate from other parts of this region where China is touching the border or where the most sensitive provinces of China, they lie. 
Okay, now that was also one of the reasons. The second reasons uh, for going for this project was I told you that there were trillions of foreign exchange reserves that were lying uh, in these Chinese banks or American banks without any usage, without any proper um, investment projects. Now the uh, President Xi Jinping he decided to use that rather than uh, let it lay down there idly. And thirdly, President Xi Jinping, uh, he has been considered one of the most ambitious presidents after Mao Zedong. If you compare President Xi Jinping foreign policy to the previous presidents of China, you will find out that he is quite, uh, you know, outgoing, he's quite ambitious, and he's quite assertive. And that makes him much more different from other Chinese presidents, especially Deng Xiaoping, who was the pioneer of Chinese development, or uh, the current Chinese advancement that we have, because it was Deng Xiaoping he, who opened up China for foreign investment, or uh, private, uh, privatization of parts of Chinese economy, which were previously controlled by the socialist government or com communist government of China entirely. Okay, so that makes it uh, the presidency or the model that this President Xi Jinping he is following because Pre President Xi Jinping he wants to invest in other countries. President Xi Jinping he clearly said that China is no more, uh, you know, a weak country. China should seek and strive for a major power role in the world politics. So that is a, um, you know, major shift in Chinese is far quite important, especially um, while discussing this debate or this topic of Belt and Road Initiative. Now, what are the main projects in CPAC? There are four main projects in CPAC, and there are four major areas where the Chinese government decided to invest after uh, the visit of President Xi Jinping um, to Islamabad in May 2015, where 50, about 50 memoranda of understanding, they were uh, signed between Pakistani government and the Chinese government. And it was decided that $48 billion of investment will be made by the Chinese government in four major areas or sectors of Pakistan's economy. The first was energy uh, projects. The second was, uh, the second was in, uh, infrastructure development. The third was Gawada port and the fourth was um, economic zones. Now, so far, most of the investment that has been made in energy projects, more than 60% of investment has been, um, you know, more than 60% of investment that has been so far made in CPAC or under CPAC that is made in energy projects. Um, the total investment so far made, there are different figures about that, which is estimated that China has so far invested in CPAC about $29 billion, 28 to 25 to $29 billion. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> this, the second is Infant, and the third is Gawada Port. And the fourth one is uh, this economic zones. Now, economic zones, that is the least development, least developed area of CPAC. And so far, the Chinese government, Pakistani government, they have been trying their best um, to come up with some feasible uh, plans to implement this project. But uh, industrial economic zones are this part of CPAC that is facing major hurdles. Now, we will come. Um, to that part of you know debate, what are the issues that CPAC is facing? Are uh, what are the major dynamics or development so far that have um, uh, you know occurred um, under the CPAC between Pakistan and China? Now, in the beginning, the Chinese government that was quite optimistic, but we know that Pakistan's economic system, Pakistan's political system that is very different from the Chinese system. A Chinese government that is very centralized, that is very authoritarian. If the central government decides some, something, then they are capable to implement those decisions even at provincial, provincial level because they have got authoritarian system, one-party system. However, this is not the case in Pakistan. In Pakistan, we have federation or uh, federal democracy where the par parliament rules the country. 
and it gives autonomy to different political parties, different political actors uh, who are active within this system, especially the provincial governments. And we know in Pakistan, provinces are provincial governments. They are based on ethnicity. For example, in Punjab, the Punjabi-dominated government will be ruling most of the times. In Sindh, the Sindhi government will be dominating uh, uh, you know, the provincial assembly. In Balochistan, Balochis, likewise in KP. So all these provinces, they are vying for a major share in CPAC, and that is making it uh, quite difficult for the central government and for the Chinese government to implement the project the way they want. The second issue is with Pakistan has this, you know, political instability, civil military divide about these projects and, you know, this uncertainty time and again, then this uh, red tape culture of bureaucracy that is not cooperating at the times with the Chinese government, that is not even cooperating with Pakistani government that is implementing part of the Pakistani government that is focused on implementation of CPAC projects. So all these issues are there. Finally, the major issue is American pressure um, that is increasingly uh, becoming emphatic vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan because the U.S. under Donald Trump administration, they decided to take on this project clearly. And from that time onward, Pakistan is facing this, uh, you know, a lot of pressure from the U.S. to strike balance between China and, you know, U.S., not to go too closer, not to get too closer to towards the U.S. That was, uh, you know, the bottom line of the Trump administration. And we know that Pakistan is also dependent in terms of, you know, military technology, uh, economic, uh, you know, aid on the U.S., um, you know, in parallel of China. So that, uh, you know, makes this, uh, you know, implementation of these projects uh, of CPAC for Pakistan quite difficult. Now, coming to the, the final and major point uh, part of, you know, this debate, that is whether CPAC is going to be a lifeline for Pakistan or it's going to be um, a death trap like it happened to some extent in case of Sri Lanka when Sri Lanka signed this Hammond Tota port project of more than $1 billion um, with the Chinese government in 2017. <clears throat> Now, this term debt trap that was first of all introduced by Indian scholar Brahma Chalini, and he wrote uh, two articles in uh, Project Syndicate online uh, platform, and he came up with this idea that CPAC uh, Belt and Road Initiative, that is nothing but it's a debt trap for the countries that are going to be excessively dependent on China under these economic investments that China is going to uh, make in these countries under Belt and Road Initiative. And at the end of the day, they, these countries, they would have accumulated so much money that they won't be able to pay the Chinese government. And the Chinese government, they will force these countries to listen more carefully to Chinese demands. And those demands, they can be, uh, you know, even controversial, like, you know, to some extent it happened in Hammond Dota port case. Now the question arises whether the same is going to happen in case of Pakistan, for example, at the very early stages of CPAC in 2016, one of the senators of Pakistan, uh, he claimed that CPAC is uh, more like, you know, East India company. So this question is very pertinent because Pakistan's economy is not doing well currently. And China has invested so much money in Pakistan, as I said, you know, 25 to $29 billion. Now the question arises that how is Pakistan going, going to pay back that money? If China has invested most of its money in the projects are um, in that sector of Pakistan's economy, that is the more deficient, that is the most problematic and which is energy uh, sector um, uh, power sector that is already running the deficit of more than two trillion pkr so this is you know quite pertinent uh, in this case study whether pakistan is going to be a story like you know humman tota or uh, you know what we call the sri lanka humman tota port debacle so that is, you know, quite interesting question. Uh, my understanding is that 
Pakistan is not going to go the way that we saw in case of Hamman Tota port. The first reason for this, uh, you know, argument is that Pakistan is not like Sri Lanka. Pakistan is very close to China. Yes, Pakistan has already become too much dependent on China, but that is not necessarily the Chinese fault. Pakistan has got its own flaws. Okay, so it's not a one-way, uh, you know, initiative that the Chinese government they decide everything and they impose everything on Pakistan. Okay, uh, the second reason for this, you know, observation that we are not going to see Hamman Tota type, you know, debacle where Pakistan will be forced to sign, you know, an agreement with the Chinese government and you know some important strategic asset that will be handed over to China. That is, you know, the reason is. China has become much more careful after learning from Hamban Tota port debacle. Hamban Tota port debacle that was not a pre-planned, um, you know, action. The Chinese government they are, um, you know, learning. They are evolving. They are going out gradually, as I told you that you know it is under President Xi Jinping government that the Chinese government has become assertive, the Chinese government has become much more outgoing. So they are learning from you know these kind of experiences. It wasn't anything pre-planned. Okay. The third reason is that um, there is too much pressure against China. There is too much pressure against Pakistan, other countries which have already signed agreements with China under Belt and Road Initiative. For example, when Sri Lanka uh, signed this Hamman Tota port deal with um, China, India, Japan, and US, they put a lot of pressure on Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka had to sign agreements with all. Uh, uh, these three countries, especially Japan and India, to uh, you know assuage their apprehensions that Sri Lanka is going to be under the control of China too much or excessively. So you know it's not like you know China sitting, um, uh, our President Xi, Xi Jinping sitting in Beijing and he decides everything. The fourth point is that it's not going to be like you know it's not nothing like you know imperialism. The reason is that. China has got a lot of money. And second important thing related to this point is that Chinese economic model that suits countries like Pakistan, countries like India, Bangladesh, these poor developing countries. Okay, so to some extent we can learn, we can uh, uh, you know gain something from Chinese development model because China has got abundant uh, raw material and these, you know, Industrial uh, industrialization technology techniques models etc cetera, etc cetera, which we don't have in Pakistan which we don't have in Africa which we don't have even in India okay so if you read this um, if you check the data of trade between India and Sri Lanka even if they are rivals you will find out that um, just uh, you know till up till the point of 2018 2017. Chinese companies they had invested a lot of you know, money in India, and it happened despite the fact that India caused China a rival as a threat, external threat. Okay, the, that the reason is that the Indian government they understand that China has got something where India can gain from. Okay, so the same applies to these countries, um, Western countries. IMF, World Bank, they have got a lot of money, but they have different model, they have different uh, development approach. They don't invest money in countries where they face risk. So <clears throat> it happened in case of Pakistan, for example, uh, you might have observed that Pakistan has to talk a lot to IMF to get just, you know, $6 billion. They have to, you know, follow a lot of rules and regulations and conditions. Now, part of these conditions, they are very important to implement but part of those conditions they are very difficult for countries like pakistan uh, for countries like you know bangladesh or other african countries to follow because their institutions they are not as advanced as these technocratic western institutions they would uh, um, you know expect these countries to be okay so taking all these points three to four points into consideration we can say um uh, we can conclude this whole debate that yes, 
these countries they are going to become much more dependent on china as a result of you know these um, bri or cpac you know investments especially countries like pakistan but at the same time we also need to bear in mind that this you know international politics that is not going one way it's not an open field for china to invest to go and pressurize these countries to sign agreements with china because china is losing a lot of money uh, because of belt and road initiative like you know i gave you example of um, this energy projects china has invested um, uh, you know a lot or 60% of investment that is made in energy projects and you s- just check you know the data uh, from 2015 onward just I- parallel to cpac investment pakistan is time and again seeking chinese loans now this is you know quite interesting the chinese and pakistani government they have been saying time and again that cpac is going to help these countries economically and financially okay but at the same time these countries they are seeking more and more loans from china the same happened in case of sri lanka sri lanka is still seeking and it is still dependent on chinese loans okay now it shows or uh, it illustrates that it's not that simple as we assume that china goes and invests in pakistan or in sri lanka and at the end of the day sri lanka will not be able to pakistan will not be able to pay back to chinese government and chinese government will ask pakistan to hand over gwadar port or other strategic you know assets are to follow the chinese commands no it's not that simple china is also losing a lot of money china is also taking a lot of risk and it's not an open field because there are other important actors like you know very recently asia nikkei a japanese newspaper they uh, published a story and that was quite revealing that a pakistani military journal one of uh, the top uh generals of pakistan military he told asia nikki that we are trying to keep balance between uh, you know us and china we don't want to get too closer to china at the cost of the us so it's not that simple as we assume yes pakistan is going to become much more dependent than china pakistan is going to be much more circumspect while you know <clears throat> giving any statements or making decisions uh on foreign policy questions that are related to chinese um foreign policy interests like you know xinjiang or taiwan or hong kong or human rights issue these kind of you know uh, <clears throat> questions okay at the same time there is you know uh, another important factor um that is not directly covered by this debt trap debate and that is you know this um china is Uh, investing too much money in these countries so that these countries they will become dependent on china and china will somehow gain access to strategic ports in these countries like you know myanmar like bangladesh like pakistan or other arab countries like you know yemen okay so there is you know another important uh, facet of this entire debate there is uh, these american scholars like you know isaac picard and um, and then andrew erickson they have written extensively about uh, this point and they think that china has got this model of civil military fusion the chinese government the past legislations and under those legislations wherever the chinese government they invest in projects those projects they can also be used for military purposes in uh, in times of contingency in times of wars now the question that is raised by these americans and other strategic scholars is that whether the same applies to projects like you know hamban tota port whether the same civil military fusion model that applies to gwadar port in the future that is you know quite interesting debate um so far it's not very clear whether uh, these countries they will give china access to these ports in times of war in times of war or in times of crisis in relations between us and china but um on the basis of observation we can say that it's not that easy because these countries they are 
uh, m uh, most of these countries they are at the same time dependent on china are uh, uh, sorry on us are us allies like you know pakistan is very much dependent on us okay pakistan um, sri lanka is very much dependent on india so these kind of countries they are not just thinking about china but they have to assuage the apprehensions of other side of you know this debate that is the us or the us allies like you know japan like india okay and european union so um we can say that it's not that straightforward pakistan might be very much dependent on china in the future and uh, you know uh, because of cpac projects pakistan is going to lose um uh, you know pakistan is going to accumulate a lot of loans and debts but that is not because of china because our economy that is not doing well even without cpac pakistan was you know having these financial constraints like you know you might have uh, read in 2008 in 2009 in 2010 11 pakistan was facing severe financial crisis at that time we didn't have you know these projects yes pakistan is going to accumulate uh, you know billions of dollars of chinese loans now <clears throat> that relates to you know lags approach of china towards belt and road initiative that they don't care about these feasibility of projects they don't care about you know the model that the western institutions they follow imf follow or uh, the west uh, world bank uh, follows and that model is you know feasibility studies so they study these projects and then they make investment but in case of china it doesn't apply because chinese government that is more from government to government and they uh, you know care more about the demands of government rather than the uh, these economic feasibilities so uh, my final observation would be that that uh, it's not going to be like you know a repetition of that imperialism like you know east india company no way it's not going to happen that way there is no comparison between these two cases there is a misplaced argument that these two can be com compared east india company or colonialism by the imperial powers of the west and china in this case yes chinese model has got a lot of flaws chinese model has got a lot of limitations a lot of downsides but if you come to the point of you know comparing it to imperialism then i don't think so uh, that it's going to be you know a new model of imperialism yes these countries they are going to become much more dependent on china but at the same time china is going to lose a lot of money china is going to lose a lot of you know soft image the failure of amentota port that was you know the failure of soft image that president xi jinping he has been stridently trying to uh, you know export and tell the world that china's model that is replicable that is imitable okay and that can be implemented and followed by more and more countries because it showed to the world that there are still many flaws in this model so it's not it is over simplification of this model that china wins by you know getting too much loans are you know uh, these countries dependent on china it's not this way because these countries at the end of the day they are going to be liabilities for china rather than assets okay so that's it for now and now i will open this um, floor for questions arfa back to you okay. thank you so much sir for enlightening us with this all and we are really sorry for the disturbance and i really apologize for the inconvenience so now we we'll move on to the questions and answers uh, the first question we have got is from ali mujahid khatak uh, why other countries are having keen interest in cpac like russia and others what interest they are having in it okay <clears throat> this is a, a sort of media rhetoric uh, russia is not that invested in uh, you know cpac okay you need to go for details rather than just media statements russia has got no interest other than just you know um passing out some statements okay so they are not interested in cpac they yes they talk about cpac because currently russia and pakistan russia and china they are getting closer 
but if you specify the same statement to you know what are they going to what are they seeking for uh, in case of you know cpac then there is nothing that they are seeking okay they have got no direct interest in this project they have got no direct stakes in this project it's far away from russia russia has got no direct connection to that russia has got not big uh, you know um, firms like china which can invest here okay the russia's model that is more dependent on energy projects gas you know companies and that is not working in this case so russia has got no direct interest yes indirectly they are interested in that and mostly they talk about it uh, within the context of you know this um, warming relations between pakistan and russia okay sir so the next question is from muhammad shaheer what will be going to happen if pakistan starts to betray china what will going to happen this is very interesting question if pakistan starts to betray china the chinese they are um, you know extremely careful um while criticizing uh, you know reacting to these kind of cases if you betray them then they are you know very circumspect if you criticize them openly then they can criticize you openly but in case of pakistan they are very circumspect however they are very clear at the same time so if pakistan betrays or uh, disappoints china then there will be very clear message from china it can be like you know pakistan time and again pakistan's economy suffers from this um, you know trade deficit or this current account deficit uh, where we have you know more imports than exports and we need you know foreign exchange reserves we need more dollars and in that in that case one of the countries one of the first countries that we you know go and seek help of that is china so in that case china can say no to pakistan the other case can be like you know uh, at un financial action task force china might you know withdraw its support from pakistan for the time being these kind of you know diplomatic um, you know repercussions that might come from beijing and you know another um, common uh, uh, you know aspect of that is that we will be passing direct message to pakistani government which in many of the cases is not public that is very secret okay thank you sir so the next question is uh, what are the uh, what is the policy of china in economical point of view for example communist or liberals um the chinese uh, they still have got this uh, socialist model um to the extent that chinese government they are paying a lot of money to these state owned enterprises and these state or owned enterprises are all uh, the important sectors of the economy inside china okay so they have uh, been you know meeting are uh, fulfilling the demands of chinese people for example chinese railway now chinese railway that is one of uh, the top railways in the world especially in the fast train and railway inside china that is having massive uh, you know deficit the chinese government is providing them money time and again because that money that is going to people they are not raising the taxes they are not privatizing these sectors of economy like we have got it in us or we have got it in other european countries or western countries which are following capitalist model so in that case we can say the chinese government somehow that is uh, you know communist but chinese government is not communist in the sense uh, as we have read under uh, you know karl marx or leninism that you know our mao zedong uh, communism under mao that everything is controlled strictly by government or uh, you know central government and people they work for the government or uh, you know collective production it, china is not having that model the chinese people uh, you know to greater extent they are working more like you know the western people um, they also face these rising prices and they also have these concerns that life is becoming much more expensive inside china because it's not you know communist model at that level 
So the next question is from Mohammad Shahir again. Uh, is there any chance that America will control China's investment by interfering in Pakistan through buying our government officials? Mm. <clears throat> that is very likely. I can say that is very likely. Um, it seems very likely. Yes. I can say to that extent, yes. Okay, so the next from Amjad Ali. Will the regional competitors, the Chabahar port of Iran, will affect negatively Gawadar port? It depends if um, that port, Iranian port that is advanced, um, that is, you know, implemented before Gawadar is functioning successfully, then in that case, yes. Uh, it might have repercussions for Gawada port. Gawada port has got a lot of limitations. And one of those limitations is that it is far away from the industrial hub at the center of Pakistan. So it lies, uh, you know, far away from, you know, these industrialized zones, our industrial areas of Pakistan, our main parts of Pakistan. Now, if you see the economic Mob, uh, model of you know ports are important ports, key ports around the world. They are well connected to industrial parts of the country. They are well connected to different parts of the country, but that is not the case in, in Gawada port. Okay, so that is you know a disadvantage. On the other side, uh, if we have this Iranian port that is more advanced, well connected then yes, definitely go out the board that will be at a disadvantage. Thank you, sir. Then the next question is from Atal Rahman. US-China rivalry has put Pakistan in a tight spot. Do you agree with this statement? Uh, yes, definitely. As I said, Pakistan's political elite, Pakistan military elite, that is very much um, pro-American. But because of these, uh, you know, necessities, strategic necessities, uh, strategic challenges, they get closer to China. However, they still prefer the U.S. And I told you that Asianiki, they recently got a story. And in that story, uh, one of the top Pakistani military officials told the newspaper that we are trying to strike the balance between U.S. and China. Even Bajwa, he visited UK twice and he assured the British government about, you know, increasing uh, warming relations between China and Pakistan. And the message was that we will keep relationship with, uh, you know, um, with China um, in balance. So, yes, that is very you know, likely. And it's from Kia Iqbal, what is the role of Baloch militants who are opposing this project by doing attacks on Chinese workers? They have seriously undermined uh, the capability of Chinese and Pakistani government to show that this CPAC project that is a success success story, especially the Boat project. So this is going to be a major challenge even in the future. How is it going to be possible for Pakistan to make sure to guarantee the peaceful flow of trade in case Gawada port is functioning, the peaceful uh, working of our functioning of um, our movement of Chinese workers, foreign investors in that region. So this is a big question mark. If Pakistan can't meet the very basic, like, you know, peace, peace is the basic of, you know, these foreign investment development model. If Pakistan can't <clears throat> gain even that basic, then how can we have, you know, this project successful in the future? Okay, so the last question is from Muhammad Imad. During the, just a moment, sorry, during the Indo-Pacific crisis, which block Pakistan would take, America or Chinese? During in the Pacific? Crisis. Which Crisis. block Pakistan? Mm. Uh, it's not that easy to say Pakistan will take the side of the US or China, but um, it's where Pakistan will be very careful if there is a direct confrontation between US and China. But again, it depends. Uh, what is that confrontation about? Is it going to be about 
Taiwan? Is it going to about Hong Kong? Is it going to about India-China rivalry? So it might vary from case to case. However, Pakistan will be in tight corner. Pakistan will not have easy options to pick. So there is a, a greater likelihood that Pakistan um, will be more circumspect, more careful, um, while showing its, uh, you know, preference for any of these major powers. At the same time, Pakistan will try to, you know, somehow assure the Chinese government because strategically Pakistan is very close to, you know, to China. But that is not going to be easy for Pakistan because the direct confrontation between China and U.S. that will mean if Pakistan goes to the side of China, it will be going against the U.S. So it's not going to be easy option for Pakistan. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for giving us your time. I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude for how happy you made us today. Thank you so much for coming all the way out here, despite of your busy schedule. We are really grateful for this to you, sir. And sure. uh, no issue. No issue. Okay. So it's all from tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining thank us today. You. Okay, Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz, sir.